Welcome back. We continue our discussion on the management of hypertension in the elderly. We will now talk about some important forms of hypertension that we may encounter in a clinical setting and can confound diagnosis. We will also discuss some strategies to address these forms of hypertension to provide better care. Now, the first of this special form of hypertension is called white coat hypertension. What is white coat hypertension? White coat hypertension is a term reserved for those not on antihypertensive medications but with persistently elevated office blood pressure of greater than or equal to 140 over 90 millimeters mercury, together with the normal daytime ambulatory blood pressure of less than or equal to 130 over 80 millimeters mercury. It may be related to anxiety when visiting a doctor's office, hence white coat hypertension, since physicians often wear white coats. This can make a person's blood pressure reading higher than normal and can lead to misdiagnosis. In some cases, these high readings may be a sign of an underlying hypertensive disorder. Nevertheless, very few cases of white coat hypertension eventually develop into full-blown hypertension. A 2015 study found that 15 to 30 percent of people with high blood pressure readings in the doctor's office might have white coat hypertension. It is more frequent in females, in those who are pregnant, and in non-smokers. It is also more common in the elderly and is more frequent among centenarians. In drug-naive hypertensives, this hypertension phenotype should be considered in individuals with office blood pressure between 130 to 159 over 80 to 99 millimeters mercury. There are various strategies that can be used to help in diagnosing white coat hypertension. First, one can wait for the patient to be more relaxed before taking another reading. Another way is to take another reading a few weeks later. However, a person with white coat hypertension will likely experience an elevated blood pressure a second time around. In these cases, the patient can be asked to take a blood pressure reading somewhere else, maybe at home. The use of an ambulatory blood pressure monitor, or ABPM, may be recommended. An ABPM is a device that a person typically wears for 24 hours. The device measures blood pressure, taking readings throughout the day while a person is at home or following their daily routine. The physician will then compare the readings with those from their office to see whether the person needs treatment for high blood pressure. The second form of hypertension is called mast hypertension. In contrast to white coat hypertension, mass hypertension is defined as a normal blood pressure less than 130 over 80 millimeters mercury at a physician's office associated with high blood pressure between 130 to 159 over 80 to 99 millimeters mercury at home. This is the exact opposite of white coat hypertension. It is more prevalent than white coat hypertension. In a 2015 study involving 3,027 people, 3.3% had white coat hypertension and 17.8% have mass hypertension. Mass hypertension has been shown to be associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events. Mass hypertension is frequent in the elderly and is associated with a high vascular risk profile. These results should encourage a more widespread use of home blood pressure monitoring in this age group. This hypertension phenotype should be considered in individuals with office blood pressure between 120 to 129 millimeters mercury and less than 80 millimeters mercury after a three-month trial of diet and lifestyle intervention. A third form of special hypertension is pseudohypertension. Pseudohypertension is a condition in which indirect blood pressure, measured by the cuff method, 
overestimates the true intra-arterial blood pressure. This is caused by the decreased compressibility of the arteries, which can affect the reliability of the cuff method of measuring blood pressure. It should be suspected if a patient develops dizziness after the start of antihypertensives or following dose escalation. Now, pseudohypertension results from medial sclerosis and or calcification of arteries and other vascular changes associated with age, which markedly decrease their collapsibility. Both the systolic and diastolic pressures are affected. The literature concerning pseudohypertension is quite limited. Indeed, the very frequency of the condition is unknown. The Oster maneuver should be performed if pseudohypertension is suspected, though it has low sensitivity and specificity. The Oster maneuver is radial artery pulse that is still palpable after the cuff is inflated above systolic pressure. Confirmation of pseudohypertension requires direct intra-arterial measurements of blood pressure. Now, how do you perform the Oster maneuver? First, inflate the cuff of the sphygmo manometer, making sure it is the right size above the systolic pressure. If the radial pulse remains palpable, the real or true blood pressure may be less than the one obtained through auscultation. Another special form of hypertension is called resistant hypertension. It is defined as blood pressure that remains above goal in spite of the concurrent use of three antihypertensive agents of different classes. Ideally, one of the three agents should be a diuretic and all agents should be prescribed at optimal dose amount. Both the American Heart Association and the JNC7 guidelines include patients who are well controlled but require four or more medications as having resistant hypertension. Resistant hypertension is prevalent across all ages but is more prevalent in elderly patients. Several factors have been identified as contributors to resistant hypertension. Poor patient adherence, physical inertia, inadequate doses or inappropriate combinations of antihypertensive drugs, excess alcohol intake, and steep apnea are some of the most common cause of resistance. Secondary forms of hypertension represent another important contributor to drug resistance. What are the different causes of resistant hypertension? One is false positive or pseudo resistance. Two is incorrect technique in measuring blood pressure. Three is pseudo hypertension. Four is lack of adherence to lifestyle modifications. Five is lack of patient adherence to antihypertensive therapy. Six is suboptimal therapy. Seven is true resistant hypertension. 8 is sleep apnea, and dusty is hypertension related to secondary etiology. We will now talk about deeper or non-deeper patients. Deeper or non-deeper indicates whether or not a patient's blood pressure falls at night compared to daytime values. A nighttime fall is normal. Nocturnal BP drop of 10% to 20% followed by an increase early in the morning. It correlates with variations in sympathetic activity, but also with other factors such as sleep quality, age, hypertensive status, marital status, and social network support. Nocturnal hypertension is associated with end organ damage and is a much better indicator than the daytime blood pressure reading. It should be noted that there is also a category of patient who rather than non-deepers are extreme deepers, which is greater than or equal to 20% nocturnal blood pressure fall, and this group may be at risk for silent and clinical cerebral ischemia due to hypoperfusion. 
during sleep. The frequency of non-dippers is higher in the elderly. After the diagnosis of hypertension is confirmed, the evaluation is now directed at assessing lifestyle, looking for cardiovascular risk factors, identifying secondary causes of hypertension, as well as searching for evidence of target organ damage. This concludes our discussion on diagnosis of hypertension and special forms of hypertension. See you next time when we discuss the epidemiology and prevalence of hypertension in the geriatric population.